Welcome to Haxby Shed and the Shaper Miller Project, Part 4. We'll start by cleaning up the outside of this piece of scaffolding pipe. It's very out of round. It's quite hard to get the sequencing right on this, but I've realised I'm going to press this in to the back plate. I'm probably going to TIG spot it. I might even TIG it all round. Probably spot it. Now that could distort it, so I don't want to finish bore until I've done the TIG work. So what I'm going to do on here is finish the outside, make a slight lead in to make it easier to press into the plate, and then finish bore it when it's already welded into the back plate. Setting up in the fore jaw now, first I'm just going to machine this edge. It's never been machined yet. I want to make sure that it's absolutely concentric with this and with the step at the back here. I may never need to clock off this. Can't see the future so I'm going to do it. This might seem a lot of trouble to go to, but there's only a quarter of a millimetre to scrape out of that bronze bush. So this really has to be aligned. Double checking. So now I need to bore this out to take this as a press fit. bought a spanner, I've started to grind it down to make it thinner. This is all it'll get used for. It's a 30mm spanner and I have another 30mm anyway so this will only be for this. I just need to take a little bit more off that spanner. I might have to machine this face. I machine the underside of this to take 10 thou off at this end. It won't be exactly parallel here and there's paint on it etc. So I might end up having to do that. Anyway those holes line up that's pretty good. My foot pedal for my welding position I might come tomorrow and it'll be easier to weld around here if I have it. So I might hold off on this now today. It's been a long enough day anyway. I mean, it's looking promising. At this stage, I'm going to TIG tack this on the back, there, there and there. Now, this was supposed to be a press fit. It is a press fit here, just below that line look. There's really nothing in it. There's only a couple of thou of wiggle, but it's enough to give that a bit of lift when I tack it. So I'm going to put some weights on it and try and keep it down. And after I've done the first tack, I'm going to have to check it. I'll wiggle this around in a moment so I can see what I'm doing. At least on this base, I can rotate it anyway. Mm-hmm. Remember to put the clamp on, that's another good idea. <laughs> Let's try again. I'm getting somewhere slowly with this TIG stuff. Mind your eyes. Two out of three ain't bad. Contaminated. Okay. Okay. I want to be certain that this is 90 to this back plate. 
So I started by a clock in the back plate. Well, the deviation here is about 0.2 of a mil. I'm not even certain that this is round, to be honest. Let's try the inside. About 35, maybe. So, it's close enough. I don't need to break the wells and realign it. This arrived this morning. I wonder what it is. Could it be a foot switch? About £11.50. So if you want that in US, multiply it by 1.3. Looks alright, doesn't it? It'll be good when I get to the point where for each of these jobs I don't have to make something first. You know, when everything's properly set up. This will only be switching 24 volts. There's normally closed, normally open. That's about 1 RPM. Chris sent me this much longer length of earth braid cable, rubberized. I just haven't had a chance to put it on yet, Chris, but thank you very much for that. I've connected this pedal temporarily. Don't worry about that because there's nothing in there beyond 24 volts. I've got some plug socket connectors on order. Right then, it's practice time. I'm not going to try and video this. I'll show you when I've finished. I think you can see two beads there. The left hand one was at 125 amps, the right hand one at 110 amps. 1 RPM, number 6 cup with a gas lens, chrome molly rod. Wiggling about a bit until I got my eye in. Oh, and what happened here? Well, I forgot to turn the gas on, didn't I? Wish me luck, folks. There's many, many hours in that piece of work. Right, on that I didn't use any filler. It was going so smoothly and I thought I could make it really neat. If I tried to use the filler, I would no doubt mess it up. So I'm going to do the back side now. Then I'll polish it, then I'll show you it properly. Right, here goes, we'll try the back. I can't video this, I just have to concentrate on the weld and nothing else. I've had people say to me, mm, TIG looks very difficult, actually you've put me off, I'm not going to buy a set now. I just hope it's not warped too much. TIG is amazing when you get it right. Right, coffee time, and then we'll see if it's still round. Clocking on this front face, that's about five one hundredths, which is about two thou. That's about two one hundredths of a millimeter. You might say, well, why am I bothering to do this? Well, it's because this bush the bore in there is only just smaller than the size of the collet chuck. I'm only going to scrape about five thou or something out of this. So I really need to get this absolutely central before I machine it. Right, well that's all trued up now. There's only just enough left on here. Just a fraction to come off this bush. I've just taken the tiniest scrape off the outside and the inside of this bush. I mean, it's literally a few thou I've taken off there. Just giving myself a lesson in parting off bronze. Turn the speed right down, 2.15 in the end seemed to be the right speed for this. It takes quite a lot of force. Funny stuff, bronze, isn't it? It's about 7.30 in the evening. I tried watching TV, but the voice in my head is saying, workshop, workshop, because I want to press this bush in. For Christmas, I got a bullfinch, and this will be the first time I've used it.
That's it. I think that'll do. That'll bed in nicely. Well, here's the moment of truth. Was all that care and measurement worth it? I've taken the plastic sleeve off here because that bearing will go right up inside that bush. Ooh. Spot on, actually. Whew, that's a relief. Well, as anticipated, I'm going to have to machine this and take 10 thou off this side, which is the opposite of what I took off on this underside here, because when I put this on with the chuck, it's such a tight fit on that chuck, so snug, if I clamp it down here, that chuck binds. But there's a fair bit more to do anyway, because I need to drill a hole through here to get at the chuck fixing screw. And also I want to put an oiler in. I happen to have a sort of trackway left over from when this bush was on the Rapidar. And just in there there's an oiler channel. So I'll intercept that and just put an oiler ball bearing on the outside here. Well that's only taken an hour. Now I can watch TV. I tell you what, setting up is a pain. Right, there should be no lift across this which there isn't, and if I go the other way, it should fall 10 thou to there. That's near enough. You know, sometimes just to get this set absolutely right, rather than messing about trying to space it up here, I just put in a feeler gauge under the vise. There's only 10 thou in there. Measuring across here with a micrometer. There, there, there and there. There's about two and a half thou difference this way and about one and a half thou this way. Well, that's close enough. To get it any closer, I'd have to put in a lot of work and it's not worth it. I tell you what, I find it much easier to read an imperial micrometer. I like to do drills in millimetres, but linear distances I prefer in inches somehow. And metric micrometers, trying to deal with that counting in halves, uh, it's much more difficult, I think. Looks nice, that, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, I can press down as hard as I like on that now, and it doesn't lock that. So that's spot on. I needed longer screws, so I bought these in steel. The others were stainless. I pinched them off my son. He always complains about that. But I don't like stainless screws, to be honest. They gall up and seize if you're not careful. It's fine if it's out on a ship where you really need it. But in the workshop, I don't like them. I'm going to ream an eight millimeter hole for the oiler to go in just there. So with the oiler done, I now need to work out where to drill the hole for the chuck fixing screw. So I've put a piece of black tape on there so I've got the depth. 
and it's going to be the distance between that and that there. Right then, is the screw going to line up with this hole? There's an Allen grub screw in there, you probably can't see it, but it's there. Woohoo! Well folks, we've come to the moment of truth. I've been working on this in the background for weeks. I've had some enabling works to do, like setting up my inverter, but it's been a long journey. So, this is it now. I won't be making any other changes to it. I don't think that I can. I can't think of anything else to do. So we'll set it up and try it out. Maybe I'll only be able to use it on soft metal. Maybe it'll do better than that. I don't know. Anyway, wish me luck. Let's give it a try. I need to get this onto the shaper now and clock up that chuck to get it spot on by just in the two screws, the two clamping screws. I just want to say a few words about this chuck. I'm trying to fit it for the last time. I'm having problems. Now, I've known for a while, actually, that this chuck seems to have a run out of about four thou or about 0.1 of a millimeter. And you wouldn't think that would be possible. But when I got this, it was nominally 14 millimeters, but it was actually about 13.97. So I reamed it out to 14. Obviously I set it up in the lathe to do that. Now, where do you clock? Here, here, in this cone. Put a collet in, clock something in the collet, on the back. All these are possibilities. And what I've discovered is that this runs slightly out from this face here. So when I've reamed it, possibly, I've got the center a fraction out. But what I've actually discovered is it doesn't run out like that. It actually cockles as it goes like this. Because I set it up in the lathe and I set it up on a mandrel. I made a very accurate mandrel for it. And when I machine it to just reduce this slightly to stop it binding uh, within my milling head, it's only taking it off this back corner here, really. So I've taken about two thou off there. So what am I really saying? Well, another point, when I put something in the collets, it runs out differently from clocking this cone, again, by about four thou, point one of a mil. So I'm not saying it's a mad chuck. I'm saying, I suppose, be very, very, very careful about your assumptions. <laughs> um, assumptions get you into trouble and you would think for sure this cone would be an accurate uh, surface to clock off but actually no this, there is a difference between how that cone clocks and how the tool clocks in the collet I've tried different collets different sizes just saying that's all just saying I'm just trying to get the very last bit of accuracy out of this thing so I've put this known bar into the collet chuck, clamped this in the fore jaw, clocked it up, remachined this back face. I did machine it before. It was quite rough when I got it. It was only just like parted off. Um, I found there was two thou across here. So like I said, I've just remachined that. Two thou on that distance could give me, you know, four thou over that distance. And I think that's it. It'll go on now and it'll be whatever it'll be. We'll have a look when I've got it on. I think it'll still be running out by, you know, 4 thou, 0 0.1 of a mil on this diameter, but we'll just see what we get now. And that'll be it. And then we'll do some test cuts. I've just finished my adjustments and this is as good as I'm going to get. Five one hundredths of a millimeter. I can also get the motor vertical in both planes. For what I'm trying to do, this is going to be it. It's quite surprising I can get it this good actually, given that the chuck's just sitting on about 25 millimeters of motor shaft. I'm gonna do a test cut on this piece of brass that we machined before. I haven't clocked the vise, I haven't clocked the work. 
It's about a one millimeter cut. Wow, that is superb, actually. I think I have zero chance of videoing this without knocking the camera, but I will try. Ah, I can't reach the handle. <laughs> oh, that's because I'm going up instead of across. Darn it. Trying to do video is the biggest distraction. So now I've done a plunge cut, I'll now start to go across again. Okay, well, we'll leave that there. Well, if you ignore my mistake, moving the table up rather than across, I think that looks pretty good. It cut really easily and the milling head seems to be very sturdy. So having done easy on brass, we'll try it now on steel. Triangular block, right mile steel, nothing's clocked, just a test. 12 millimeter carbide end mill, one mil cut. If it cuts one mil okay, I'll try something a bit bigger. Well that looks alright, I'll try 2 mil, and if that works, I'll say we're done. Of course I could do this on the shaper, I'd only be using the milling head for pockets and blind ends. That's probably a little bit too much for it, but one mil is fine. Let's carry on at one mil. Let's do a half mil finishing cut. Well, it's been a long project, but I hope you found it interesting. Thanks for watching Haxby Shed. Well, we've come to the end of the series. Parts 1, 2 and 3 are out, and I've got quite a lot of comments back. And I'd like to respond to two comments in particular. The first and easiest one is about my welding on this collar here, and not using any filler wire. Now, I do understand that it won't be as strong and then if you weld without filler wire it does undercut. That's not really how you should do it but I did it for two reasons really. Uh, the first is I wanted to minimize the amount of heat I was putting into this and I didn't want to distort this collar or the plate. Now in the event there was a bit of distortion but it was manageable. But the other reason uh, is that my TIG welding has not yet progressed to the point where I can reliably weld a fillet with filler wire and make it look nice. And I figured out this would be a nice neat way to do it, even though it's not really the right way to do it. The second comment is a bit more difficult to handle. Um, it's about whether or not you should use ball bearings or taper bearings in the spindle. Because ball bearings always have some amount of clearance in them, and uh, you're likely to get chatter. Whatever it is you do, you might get some chatter. So I'm having a look around 
and I found some taper bearings that would fit this motor. I think they're 3202s. The bearings that are in are 6202s, I think. So that's 15 millimeter in the center, 35 on the outside, and something like 11D. And I'll have a look at putting those in. I'm going to buy them, I'm going to try them in. Not quite sure how I'd set the preload on uh, this back end here. Uh, there is a wave washer on there. It's pretty strong. It may be enough, I don't know. Um, but that's what I'm going to do to improve it as the next step. But you can't let a series of videos run forever. Uh, I think four is enough. And then maybe I'll just put in one throwaway point and that's a bit about this. If you saw in part two, I was using this big heavy lump uh, of a chuck and a, a carbide burr to put the ends on these plates here, these curved ends on here. And uh, I think people watching were more worried than I was that this was gonna break loose from the taper and fly around the workshop because it was spinning at 2,500 RPM. Now I think my, I was relaxed out of ignorance really. <laughs> I was lucky I got away with it. Um, I don't know, I might hesitate to try that again. Anyway, that's got to be the end of it. I hope you've enjoyed this series. Uh, see you next time.